All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Morning. How are you guys doing? Well, we'll get through the service before the heat really sets in. All right. I was kind of warned that last week it was a little stuffy. I was warned that's nothing. So I was like, oh boy, okay. We'll see how it goes. So I, I dressed accordingly. I, I expected the hottest, so uh, we'll see how things go today. I uh, just want to piggyback off of what Pastor Andy mentioned in the announcements that along with uh, the youth, the Anchor Fellowship being uh, canceled this Friday, uh, the adults will also will take this Friday off because assuming that you as a family may have plans over the weekend, so uh, we will hold off this Friday and they will start back up in person the following Friday. And I want to encourage you all, if you haven't uh, joined us yet when, when it was online or certainly last Friday, I want to encourage you guys to come and there's nothing like being in person, right? Uh, for those of us who are, who are here Friday night, I, hopefully you could say that. It was, it was great to be in person, talking face-to-face, -face, um, sharing that time together. So we want to encourage you all, if possible, to join us. Uh, we met in one of the classrooms Friday night, and I think it was a good time of sharing and, and conversation. So hopefully you can join us. Uh, because, I mean, frankly, Sunday, Sunday can get busy. After service, you know, we, we're kind of busy. We have conversation, but we don't get to really engage with each other as much as we probably would like to. So we want to encourage you all to be a part of that as well. All right? All right, let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for this, this beautiful day, Lord. It's hot, but uh, here in Southern California, we can, we can get a little picky. Um, we take it for granted. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful day. Thank you for this day that you have given us to be able to worship together. Thank you for allowing us to be able to be indoors to worship you. We continue to pray for our state, the country, and the globe as we continue to deal with the, the virus, Lord. Um, as strains pop up, we pray that you would uh, protect us. Keep us healthy, Lord God. Help us to live in wisdom. And Lord, we just ask that your hand would be upon us, Lord God, as we come faithfully here. May you uh, be with us in our congregation, Lord. And Father, we pray as we come and as we take this time to be at your feet and hear your word, Lord, we do pray your Holy Spirit would speak to us. It'd be your words, Lord, that we hear, that echoes in our hearts and in our minds, that sinks in, Lord. So open our ears and our hearts and our minds and we give this time to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen. So as many of you know that, um, you know, pretty soon our family is going to uh, need to relocate. We're going to be looking for a play, permanent place to, to, to live and stay. So hopefully within, closer in the area so we can be closer to everybody. Um, so we're, we're always looking forward to that. I, actually, I, I hate moving, but I'm looking forward to that move, that, that phase. Um, I know Michaela, I know one thing that she's really looking forward to about moving is getting a dog, right? She's been wanting a dog for a long time. She's been giving me puppy eyes for puppy eyes for a very long time. And I'm sure, you know, if, if Jamie and Michaela have their way, we're going to have it like as soon as we walk into the doors, you know, they're going to say, okay, where's our dog, Right. But um, we know it's a matter of time. We know she's been wanting a dog for a long time, ever since she was little. And so uh, I think it was a year, maybe two years ago, we got her, or she got the next best thing. She got an ant farm. <laughs> was it a good substitute? I don't know, maybe not, right? How many of you have ever had an ant farm? How many of you are wondering why you would ever have an ant farm? All right. So, all right, if you never had one before, they don't come with their ants. I was kind of surprised. I'm like, oh, I guess it makes sense they wouldn't come with the ants. You have to order the ants. So you order the ants, and they come in these vials. Now, we happen to get our ants, and I think we got like killer ants or something, or like some mutant ants. I don't know if you could tell from the picture, but these ants were not these small little black ants. I was expecting these nice, cute little ones. These things were like huge. I think you could ride them. They were that big. And so how to get them in there, you see, you see the top there. There's a little slit off the top. And they, the ants come asleep. 
And you have to wake them up in order to put them into the little, the little ant farm thing. Now, that was a little stressful because these ants apparently were like, you know, they could like bite you and it'll hurt a lot or something. And here we are, we're trying to wake them up to put them in. And all they give us is this little plastic stick to kind of, you know, push them along inside. It got stressful because they got awake and the more time went in, they're more awake. We're having to kind of wrestle and try to, try to guide these ants in before they kind of start crawling over our table. So it's a little stressful getting an ant farm. And so some of you are wondering, why in the world did you get an ant farm? Well, I got to admit, after they were all safely inside this little ant farm, it took some time to settle in. You know, they're getting acquainted with their living space. But after an amount of time, it was fascinating. Ants are pretty fascinating creatures. They're always on the move. I didn't see one ant just chilling on the top of the barn there in the ant farm. I didn't see an ant just kind of laying back, like, oh, this is the life. Have a little cup of nectar, sitting back, watching other ants go by. They're like, oh, man, this is the life. I don't have to do any work. I didn't see one ant like that. They were constantly moving, doing something. And I wondered, what are they doing? Why are they moving one piece of grain of sand in one side of the ant farm through some tunnels and into the other side? I was curious. You know, I read about some ants. So, so let me give you some background about ants. I know, this is fascinating, right? You came to service to hear about ants. Is this me? All right. Hopefully that goes. All right. So ants. Ants are among the most highly organized organisms in nature. Every ant has an assigned task, and the entire colony works together as one living creature to keep the colony alive, protected, and fed. Ants have been shown to work together as a team to break apart large food elements to bring down into the nest. Ants also have been shown to create bridges and tunnels with their own bodies to shelter the rest of the colony as it rushes out to find food. Ants work together to attack threats from people, animals, and other ant colonies. Ants have been shown to group together to create rafts to ensure the colony survives flooding. Ants are also very clever when it comes to work. They build chambers underground to store food, to rest in, and to store their eggs. During the day, worker ants will transport eggs to chambers closer to the surface, where it's warmer, until the day begins to cool off. The workers will then transport the eggs back down further into the ground and closer to the combined heat of the colony. It's kind of fascinating. When you see ants moving about, they're doing something. Right? They all look busy, but they're busy with a purpose. When they're bringing soil from the bottom up, and you see the, the ant hill that we see, it's all to control temperature underneath, and they're all living in the nest within the hill. Pretty fascinating things. And it made me kind of think, on a given Sunday, I wonder if we kind of look like colonies of ants. Right? On a given Sunday, we're kind of a little busy sometimes. Is there a busier morning than Sunday morning? Right, you're all about, you're moving places, you know, worship team comes early, they're setting up and moving about, we see people setting up the fellowship, the, the, the coffee and everything, everyone's moving around, making sure tables, it's all like this. We can all look pretty busy, but are we busy with a purpose? Are we busy with the right purpose? When we started talking about fellowship a couple weeks ago, I mentioned how fellowship and service go hand in hand. When you're talking about fellowship, when you're talking about service, it often goes hand in hand. We want to serve in the context of our fellowship, and our fellowship needs to be service-minded. I'll say that again. We want to serve in the context of fellowship, as we're fellowshiping together, and our fellowship needs to be service-minded. What do I mean by that? Our fellowship, the time that we share, we have with one another. We talked about the last couple of weeks. 
The time we share together should have this principle that we want to honor each other, right? We want to be there for each other. We want to hold each other's needs even higher than our own, right? There's that principle. So when we share this time together, we're not just in it for ourselves, but you know what? We're here for somebody else, right? If you've been here for every week or you've been here once every few weeks or months, you can be here not just for yourself, but you can be here also for somebody else. So we talk about that with fellowship. When we engage in conversations, are we engaging in conversations not only for our own interests, but for the interests of somebody else? Right? Have you ever had a conversation with somebody? You talk with somebody, and when you walked away from that conversation, you kind of had this feeling like, wow, you know, that was a good conversation. Not only was I blessed by it, but I think they were blessed by it too. How rare is it sometimes to have that kind of conversation where like, wow, you know what? That was, that was actually good. I actually got something out of it. I think I gave them something out of it, right? Our fellowship and our service has to go hand in hand, right? We're doing for each other. So when we have an edifying fellowship that we're talking about, serving faithfully should come naturally, right? The title of the message today is Faithfully Serve. When we have the kind of fellowship that we are interested in each other, we want to honor each other, we want to be here for each other, serving each other is going to come naturally, right? Your desire is to care for somebody, so out of your sincere desire, you know what? I want to do something for somebody else, or I want to do something for the Lord. So these next two weeks, we're going to look at this principle for our church and principle for our own lives, faithful service. How do we have faithful service? So, of course, turn to Romans chapter 12 if you have your Bible. Romans chapter 12. And we're going to see that if you've done any kind of study or you've heard messages about sermons, this passage in Romans parallels two other passages in particular. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, and he also wrote a letter to Ephesus. And we're going to see some parallels from this passage and in 1 Corinthians, and in Ephesians in the coming this week, and or today and next week. So turn to Romans chapter 12. We're going to start again in verse 3. Okay? Verse 3. For through the grace given to me, I say to every man among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the uh, proportion, excuse me, of his faith. So we see here in this passage... Paul uses this image of, the, of a body. And he says, but just like a body, we're all different parts with all different, or maybe have different functions, just like the parts of our body is. Our body is composed of different parts and different parts that have different functions. Paul uh, uses, or he also says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 14. He says, for the body is not one member, but many. And he goes on in verse 18. But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. So Paul emphasizes, we represent different parts of the body, and together we compose and make up the body. And just as the placement of each part of our bodies are not randomly placed, we're not randomly placed in the body of Christ. Now imagine that for a second. Can you imagine if God created us randomly? Can you imagine if our body parts, its positioning was random? Would that be a little weird? Can you imagine if one person, their ear was actually placed maybe like on the top of their head? How would that look? right? That poor person, when it rains, they can get ear infections all day, right? 
Isn't it a good thing that our parts aren't randomly placed? What if some of us walked in, I'm wearing shorts, what if one day you saw and I showed you that I actually have a thumb that sticks out of my, my knee? Just randomly. That'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? God did design our bodies that way. We're not, there's not parts randomly placed in different places. There's a function. There's a reason that it's there. I don't know why we have five fingers on our hands, but it'd be kind of odd now if we had a finger that stuck out of our palm, right? Likewise, we have to kind of take this and consider it. Look at what Paul says. He placed each one just as he desired. I don't believe that we're here randomly. I don't know how you found Generations Church. I don't know if you looked it up on the internet. You did a Yelp search, and Generations Church found, was, was placed there. And he's like, well, that's kind of random. Let's just try this church. I don't know why. But I don't believe you're here out of random circumstance. You can be here for a purpose. Now, I would want you to be here for a purpose. Whether this is your home church, maybe this isn't your home church. It's a good thing that while we're one body here, at the same time, Generations Church is one part of a greater body of Christ. We may have a role and a function in the greater scope of the church. Whether this is your home church, maybe there's another church that's going to be a place where, you know what, this is where God would want me to be. That's kind of a a daring thing for a pastor to say, because as a pastor, we want you all to be able to be here. We want you to have this be a place where, you know what, this is where I can grow, that I can have community, that I can worship God, and that there's a, a reason for me to be here. I can serve somebody, and I know that someone's here to serve me as well. But there's going to be a purpose. So I love the fact that it says that, you know, God didn't just randomly place us, but there's something that we can do in the body of Christ. This leads to the next point. We also see that God is a giver of gifts. We saw a couple weeks ago that we saw that God, out of his grace, gives us gifts. Romans chapter 12, verse 6. And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. We see here there's a general reference that it's God who gives us gifts. But in 1 Corinthians... There's a a specific reference to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has a role in this in verse 11 of chapter 12. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So here's an example of where we see the Father, the Son, and the Spirit working in concert together. Right On a side note, that's kind of a big side note, we're talking about the nature of God, that he is a triune God, or the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit. We see here that the Father, Son, and Spirit is always working in concert, working together. And we see this here in the giving of gifts. It's God who gives us the gifts. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us the gifts. Right? Now, you may think, you know, how many have ever heard of spiritual gifts before? How many of you have done one of those spiritual gifts tests? Okay. I hope I don't get you in trouble or somebody in trouble will get somebody mad. I don't like those gifts, those tests. I hope I don't upset anybody. They're fun to do. They're interesting to see the results in. But I don't know how accurate they are in measuring spiritual gifts. Here's why. Here's the difference, I think, of spiritual gifts and talents. We may all have talents. God-given talents that he's given us. Maybe you have a talent in music. Maybe you have an athletic talent or ability. Maybe you have a talent for math. Maybe you have a talent for whatever it may be. Okay? You have a talent that God has given you that you can exercise, you can grow in, you can hone in, that you can do exercise that talent on your own. Maybe through hard work, maybe you're just a genius, I don't know right? So that is God-given for sure. But a spiritual gift is God-given, but it's different. How is it different? A spiritual gift is given by God, it's empowered by the Spirit of God, and it's made effective by the Spirit of God. Spiritual gifts are effective 
beyond the capabilities and effectiveness of what you could have done on your own. Right? If you've done a sport and you swam or you ran or you played a sport, you scored a touchdown, you scored a, a basket, whatever it may be, whatever sport, whatever music piece, you did that out of your hard work, out of your dedication. You physically did those things, right? You achieved that goal. I'm not saying God is completely outside of the influence, but you are naturally able to do that. A spiritual gift, you may have exercised something, done something physical, but the effect, the power, and the opportunity is God-powered. Let me give you an example. Actually, let me hold off on that. I'll give you an example in a second. Let me go on to the next thing, and I'll give you that example. One of the gifts that God gives us is faith. Now, that's a very understated gift. Among the list of spiritual gifts, strangely, faith is not commonly brought up. But faith is a gift of the Spirit. Verse 3, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. In verse 8 of 1 Corinthians 12, he said, Paul says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, and to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit. We're all saved through faith and have a basic measure of faith, right? We all have a basic measure of faith. That's how we come to faith. We come to believe in Jesus. However, we can have additional faith. We can be given more faith. Our faith can grow. It's not like God, when we come to Christ, God gave us just an exact amount of faith and that that's all you get. We can, get. we can grow in our faith, we can have more faith, and we can have a special gift of faith. And I think of it like this. Last week, after church, I had a gathering with my family. I was driving on the freeway, and I looked and I drove. I looked at the, my gas meter. The light went on. I was on E. So what do I do when, I'm, when you're on E, drivers? You have to, first you got to look for a gas station, right? But you kind of ease up on the gas pedal, right? Because apparently the faster you drive, faster your, your gas will kind of eat up, right? So I had to ease up from the speed I was going. I'm going to tell you how fast I was going. And I got off the freeway. I was looking for a gas station. I got some gas. The basic things, a car needs the basic amount of gas to function, right? But if you want to travel long distance, if you want to travel with a certain speed, you need to make sure you have enough gas to be able to do those things. True? Think of it this way, in terms of faith. God is giving you a portion of faith, the basic faith to, to believe in him, and a basic faith to grow. But here, faith is also a spiritual gift that he can give you as well. When you think of spiritual gifts... You can have a talent, you can be a talented musician, you can play songs really well, but there may not be a spiritual gift in that, because this, what measures a spiritual gift is God working in you. I can be up here, or you can have a speaker, an incredible speaker, so talented, so entertaining. I mean, it captures you, it's riveting. But they don't, if they don't have a spiritual gift, a prophecy or the word of God speaking through them, you could come away with saying, you know what, that was a great speech. That drove me nuts so many times. After a message, after a sermon, I would have someone come in and say, you know what, that was a wonderful speech. And I was like, oh, <laughs> that kills me. I don't want to give a speech. I don't want to give a speech. Because the speech kind of comes, comes across as like, you know, that's something that you're persuasive in your words and whatever you want to put together. I want the word of God to speak. Paul, in reference to faith as a spiritual gift, look what he says about in his preaching. He understood this concept. Here we go. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and my message and my preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the Holy Spirit and of power, that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. Paul understood. He said, when I, come preach, when I came preaching to you, it wasn't with persuasive words. He may not have been the best order. He might not have been impressive in his composition of his words when he, pro- he preached. He said, I didn't come with that. That's not where the power is. The power was of the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. That your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. See, when we serve, we will see that our faith and the Holy Spirit works in cooperation with each other. That's how we ought to serve. Serving is more than just the action. Serving is the exercising of faith for a purpose outside of your own abilities. Last week when we played volleyball, I didn't pray and say, God, give me the gift of volleyball. May I jump as I used to. I didn't even try. (laughs) Maybe I should have prayed for that. I don't know. Right, when we go and we play things, we, we kind of rely on our natural abilities. When we serve, sometimes we get occupied with that same mentality. We just end up doing how we expect to be able to do. But see, when we serve in faith, we're doing something with an expectation that God is going to accomplish and work beyond what we can naturally do. We practice to do the best that we can. But when we rely on the results, rely on the effectiveness, we say, God, we want you to do beyond what we can do ourselves. That's serving in faith. So he says, Paul says, serve according to the proportion of faith that God has given you. We all have a measure of faith as we've come to Christ. And you may have at times wanted to look for opportunities. God, how can I be useful? What can I do? How many have ever been in a situation you feel like you want to do something? Maybe you've even been asked to do something, but you feel like, I don't know if I can do it. I've never done it before. This is beyond my comfort level. This is not my kind of personality to do. Right? We've all been there before many times. You know what Paul's saying here? He's like, look. Just do according to the proportion of faith that you have. If you feel like you have little faith, then God's saying, okay, take that little faith and just do it. Serve accordingly and see what happens. See what God can do. See how your faith can grow. But just do according to the faith. Don't rely on your abilities. Don't rely on what you're, you're naturally capable of. Right? God may gift you with a spiritual gift that may be outside of your natural tendencies. I shared with people, it's surprising. If you told me 30 years ago, or maybe not even 30 years ago, even longer than that, that I would be preaching in front of people as a teenager, I would have said, you're crazy. I would have went, Jonah, I would have left Jonah in the dust. I would have went beyond Tarsus. I would have just went way on the other side. But see, what happens when you just say, all right, God, in faith, I'm going to trust that here's something that you want me to do. I'm going to do it and trust in you with the results. Serving with faith and this Holy Spirit working hand in hand. We're going to take a, take a look more of that about spiritual gifts next week. Paul wants to look at how should we serve. What does Paul say in Romans 12? We're going to continue verse 6. He says, And since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let each exercise them accordingly. According to what? According to the measure of faith that God has given you. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service, in his serving. Or he who teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts, in his exhortation. He who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be without hypocrisy. 
Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. So how should we serve? Look what he says. If you're going to serve, serve in faith. And whatever opportunity you have, I don't care if it's setting up tables and chairs, whether it's going up to somebody and saying, hello, how are you? I've never met you before. Introducing yourself. Whether it's going over and seeing somebody who seems like they're having a hard time saying, hey, you know, I don't really know you too. Can I pray for you? Whether it's on the worship team, whatever circumstance, serve in faith. Don't worry about, man, I'm not this person. I don't have like their faith. Don't worry about that. According to the proportion of the faith that God has given you, serve in faith. Believing that God will work beyond what you are capable of. Beyond what you are comfortable with. So serve in faith. The second thing, teach in faith as we see. Teach in faith, believing the Lord will speak beyond even your words. In all your preparation, you plan whatever it is that you teach. When you teach in faith, you're saying, God, when I do it, I believe that you can do a work that goes beyond even what I'm saying, what I think I'm saying. My prayer every single Sunday is that you don't remember this time as Pastor Mike's time, but that, you know what, God is speaking to me about something, and Pastor Mike doesn't even know this about me. So when you teach, teach in faith, knowing that God's going to go beyond it. Third thing it says here, exhort others in faith. Exhortation. When you exhort others in faith, you're believing that you will say something maybe uncomfortable, but necessary for those who listen. There are those who are gifted in exhortation. What does that look like? That means someone who God gives opportunity to speak through them to give a word of exhortation to somebody else. And usually that's uncomfortable. You know what exhortation is, right? It's like a charge. You're charging somebody. You're trying to encourage them. But usually in that encouragement, you're kind of uh, highlighting something that, you know, that needs to be addressed. But you want to encourage them. You want to charge them to do something. And a lot of times that comes with uncomfortableness. But God may use them in that circumstance. So when you exhort, exhort in faith, knowing like, okay, Make sure it's not of your own flesh, right? You see somebody, you're like kind of judging them. You're like, yeah, man, they need a word, some like exhortation. I'm going to tell them what's up. No, 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 no. But maybe God gives you an opportunity to speak a word to them. And you may not know the circumstance. You may not know why. But you exhort them in faith. Paul talks about give sincerely or generously. In other words, without self-seeking interest. When you give to somebody, don't give thinking, you know what, man, what are they going to give back to me? Sometimes that's hard to do. Sometimes it's hard for us to receive from others. Because if we receive from others, that means they're going to expect us to give back, right? But when we give, don't give thinking, all right, I'm giving a lot, so they better give back a lot, He says, when you give, just give in sincerity. Give generously without self-seeking interest. Preside over. Those of you who lead, lead with diligence. In other words, when you preside over something, do it with diligence and zeal. We'll encourage church council and church leadership. If you're presiding over something, an area of ministry, whatever it is, do it with diligence, but do it with zeal. We want you to desire doing it. Have a desire to, man, this is a passion. This is something that I want to be able to do. If you're in leadership in any circumstance, whether you're in youth, I know there's some high schoolers who are helping out with Anchor. Or maybe you're an adult, you're helping out with CE. Whatever the circumstance, if God is giving you an opportunity, do it with diligence, but do it with zeal, with a sense that, you know what, here's an opportunity God has given me to be a blessing to somebody else. And I want to encourage those of you who have been in leadership with Anchor, that is a blessing. It may be difficult, certainly may be challenging and stretching. I've been there. I know. 
But what a great blessing to be able to instill and share the love of Christ to your younger brothers and sisters in Christ. That's an honor. What a blessing. So if we lead, lead with diligence and zeal. And lastly, it says, do not be lazy. Oh, I'm sorry. Show mercy with cheerfulness. Help those who are afflicted with a cheerful heart. Some of us, maybe you can relate to this, you're, you're tired of sharing prayer requests. Because you feel like when you share prayer requests, you feel like people have this expectation that they're, it's all going to be better. And when things aren't better over the course of time, it's kind of like, well, I don't know, I kind of feel like stop asking you. Or you're in a prayer circle, and everyone's sharing prayer, and there's one person who just has a lot of prayer requests. And you're like, oh, okay, here it goes. Here's 20 minutes with this person. Show mercy with cheerfulness. If you give to somebody your time, do it with a cheerful heart. And then do not be lazy. Don't lag in diligence, but with a zealous spirit, serve the Lord. Serve the Lord with zeal. Wrap up with this, some things to think about. Service is our gifts in action. You think, well, what, what are my gifts? Well, hold on. Well, we'll look at what possibly may be some areas that God has gifted you in next week. But service is our fellowship in action as well. Here's some things to do. One, pray for gifts. Paul talks about, he encourages believers to pray and seek out these gifts. 1 Corinthians 12, 31, chapter 14, verse 1. Again, we'll look at these next week. But pray for gifts. If you're wondering, like, God, I don't know if I have a spiritual gift. Pray for the God. May you empower me to do something that goes beyond what I can do myself. Pray for opportunities. Sometimes you may not realize it until you have those opportunities. You take those steps of faith to take advantage of the opportunities you have. And oftentimes, those are the times when you experience, you, you discover the gifts that you have. It's not like one morning you're going to sleep and you're going to wake up and a light's going to shine on you and then just you're going to receive some kind of supernatural thing. But it's often discovered as you take advantage of opportunities. Third thing, pray with faith-filled expectations. Pray with faith-filled expectations. I can fall short in this in so many ways. I think I have a predictable expectation of how things are going to happen. How is fellowship? How is Bible study? How does Sunday sermon go? I don't know. I rely so much on how I feel. Have a faithful expectation. You know, God can do amazing things. Last thing, serve with grateful hearts. Serve with grateful hearts. Serve with generous hearts. And serve with with eager hearts. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, as we look at serving, Lord, we recognize we're not just serving, we're not just doing actions, we're not just doing things. We don't want to just be busy. We don't want to just be found running around, carrying things and doing things, saying things. We want to have a purpose, Lord. We want our service to be faith-filled. And we want to serve faithfully. Lord, I pray that you would find this church useful for you. That each one of us can find a place in this church where we can grow, we can worship you, we can minister to each other and we can serve each other as we serve you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for this time and we lift it to you, Jesus, in your name. Amen.